Well, we've all been involved in this story, um, especially when the attorney for the family was here and dropped some bombshells last week. But this question is about Armour Correctional Health Services, which is contracted to run Duval County's uh, jail's health care. And they continue to mount after Dexter Barry, a heart transplant recipient, died last November after he didn't get his anti-rejection medication while in jail. I'm sure all of us have seen the video from the backseat of the police car as he told the officer, I need to take these meds three times a day. In fact, I didn't get my last one. The officer sounded sympathetic, tried to get a supervisor to come up with some idea. But apparently, Mr. Barry ends up in jail, does not get his meds. By the time he's out, the meds apparently arrive at the jail and then... He unfortunately passes away. So Andrew Pantazzi, the tributary staff, uh, obviously did a lot of work on this. I've done some research, but not a lot. Uh, certainly we are aware that uh, that uh, Tony Baselli, former Jaguar, uh, is an active lobbyist with them. Um, the big question that came from the attorney and others for the family is, why didn't the jail staff, the armor uh, folks, just send them to, the, to a hospital and take it away from their hands and their problems? So take it away. Yeah, so there's still a lot of things we're looking into, and my coworker Nicole Manna at the Tributary has been digging in deeper and deeper into some of the problems with Armor Correctional and the medical care at the jail. Uh, but lately what we've been trying to show is how much JSO should have already known about Armor Correctional before they ever privatized their medical care in 2017. In 2017, after then Sheriff Mike Williams had taken over, Mike Bruno as Corrections Director, they signed a deal to privatize away the, the medical care and hire this outside group, Armour Correctional, who had hired Tony Baselli as their lobbyist. Already, Armour had developed a reputation for its poor care across the country. Um, and when they re-signed that contract uh, last October um, under uh, interim sheriff uh, Pat Ivey, at that point, they'd been criminally convicted in another state. Um, they had uh, been removed by most sheriffs in Florida who had initially hired them because of the poor care in their counties and because many of those sheriffs, including our neighboring uh, Baker sheriff, said they were lying to them, they were misleading, they were, they were withholding information from sheriffs, um, and they were doing the bare minimal amount of care they could um, and billing as much as possible from taxpayers. Yet, despite all of this being known widely by sheriffs across the state, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office signed a lengthy extension um, that amounts to more than $90 million total over the course of the contract with Armour Correctional to continue handling the medical care. And now what they've said is that they did order the heart transplant uh, anti-rejection medication for Dexter Berry, but that it would take at least 48 hours plus an extra I think four to six hours. So they're saying at minimum, it's gonna take two and a half days to get medication that these recent transplant recipients need to take three times a day. And if you don't take it and you're a recent transplant recipient, your body's gonna reject that transplant. They're so Friday arrest, Monday release, at that point with two and a half days of these, without these meds, it's too late no matter what happens. That's what the cardiologists ha ha that we've spoken to have said is that by that point, um, it's too late. Your body has already now started to reject this heart that he waited 10 years um, on a transplant list to get. Um, and you know, you gotta think of how much effort goes into, you know, when Mayo Clinic or, or any other hospital is doing a heart transplant, and then to go into a jail that's not ready to deal with uh, these specialized medical needs. And for him especially, the, the other question is why he was even arrested in the first place for something that was so minor as, he and a neighbor were arguing over the neighbor not paying for Wi-Fi that, that Mr. Barry was providing. Um, and at, he said, you know, I'm going to beat you up using a, a profanity um, if you don't pay. Um, but both men were handicapped and elderly. It did not seem like a very legitimate threat. And the police officer arrives and decides he needs to take away Mr. Barry and arrest him um, on this charge. And that ends up uh, amounting to what seems like a death sentence um, based on the lack of medication that he received. And what we hear is that if, even if his girlfriend had been able to go back in the house and get the meds, the jail policy does not allow you to drop it off because the jail, maybe rightly so, uh, doesn't know what's in that container. Um, but the officer apparently was sympathetic enough to try to talk to the supervisor, and the logic says maybe that officer could have gotten someone to go back to the house with Mr. Barry in the back seat, going, it's in this room, and get it. And at worst, there would have been a few hours delay. So let's I mean, open this up. Individual case is like you know its own. There's a lot of complexity, right? But oh, the yeah. big issue is when you're dealing with privatized, you know, medical care in a in a prison or a jail. And Armor obviously has contracts across the country and across the state. 
but they're dealing with a very transient population. They're dealing with a very unhealthy population, mm -hmm. and they're trying to cut costs. And one thing that you've seen in other areas around the country is that there's been these short-term issues with Armour administering medicine quickly. And often people are coming in and out of the jail if they don't have to administer meds immediately. It can be a money-saving thing. And so it's not necessarily um, that they're making that calculation, but they certainly are every time that they have to decide whether they're going to administer a medicine or not. That person could be gone or discharged or bonded out by the time that mm -hmm. they actually receive the medicine that they I mean, I mean dispense. logically, you have a private medical care contract coming in saying, we can be cheaper than you doing this in-house and we can be a for-profit company that is serving our shareholders or ser serving our <laughs> uh, uh, fiduciary interests while also being cheaper. That means they're cutting costs somewhere. They're providing substandard service somewhere. They're, they're having to find some way to, to cheapen what's uh, being given. And you're deciding as a city, as a sheriff's office, that you're okay with spending less and potentially getting substandard care. Well, the jail did actually do its own medical care at one point, and then it contracted and worked with the Department of Health in Florida. But the logic here, I'm being told, is that Armour came in and said, we can save you millions mm -hmm. on the contract. And that was the draw. And then with lobbying to show that that savings would allegedly happen. But you're right. With cost savings comes sa problems with service. And, and, and let, let me say this, if I can, real quick. Yeah. My understanding is that the contract did not save money. Duval County had one of the lowest costs of providing inmate uh, health care in the state by far. When they brought the contractor in, they act, the costs went up. Yeah, but that's what Armour's promise was to everybody, I'm sure. <laughs> Correct. The, you know, the thing that I, I see wrong here is that this is a very, I guess, specific prescription. They're not going to have it on a shelf, right? They're going to have to order it. It's going to... I, I, I can I can understand why they wouldn't have it readily available because how many individuals are you going to get arrest are going to be arrested who's just had a heart transplant a week before or six months before? So that said, something fell through the cracks. If this is beyond the scope of your capabilities, then to your point, Dan, why did someone say, "Hey, listen, we don't have this. We understand the significance of the health risk. Trans transport them to Chance." But yet, Mr. Barry's attorney says that since announcing this, he has heard from another former inmate who was a transplantee. Correct. So this is obviously something that should be in the scope of a subsection of the contract that says if a very specific issue comes in, this is how we handle it. Exactly. Because apparently there's a lot of deaths that have occurred in jails. In fact, last Friday we got an email from JSO about a patient, an inmate, sent to a hospital who then passed away. They call that an in-custody death, even though that apparently that person was sent to be hospitalized. I mean, you do have to be fair. That, that is a very unhealthy population. They, you know, they're, they're, you know, 20 year life expectancy less than the average person, you know, and, and a lot of times people are living in difficult situations when they're incarcerated. They have some addiction issues. Um, the bar is pretty high for like the level of care that would be needed to provide, you know, mm -hmm. for, for this very at risk population. But the issue of Everything when it comes to our carceral system is that we try to do it on the cheap. We want to lock everybody up for crimes, but we do not want to pay for the fact that it's very expensive to house someone and care for someone. Um, and it's, you know, there's there's enormous costs that are already well beyond health care that are safety issues for people who work in these facilities, um, the guards that work there. It's, you know, there's a lot of ways that we're cutting costs that are making it less safe. And don't forget that many years ago, a sheriff decided to cut costs by serving only bologna sandwiches at the Duval County Jail. So, um, and I don't, I know they don't do that now, but 